worked remotely. Uh, we've had a little last minute change to the lineup. Unfortunately, Jürgen from the ECB is not joining us, but we do have a very happy last minute addition to the panel, Anna Martin from the consumer NGO Bayerk. Uh, but before we hand it over to the panelists for their opening remarks, I do have a question for those of you in the room. Sorry, I'm already turning the lens directly on you. What do you know about the digital euro? Any volunteers? Any hands at all? Please. Okay, so and sorry, <laughs> please go ahead. Um, yeah, that, that, that's right. Uh, I, I don't think that um, they, they, they're not looking into the design um, of the system as much as trying to work within, within the system and see if it's possible to do something in place. Mm -hmm. Anybody else in the room? No one in this room knows anything about the digital euro. Yes, I'm seeing another hand at the back. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, the question uh, uh, myself uh, is that it's going to be programmable money and from the moment that it's programmable money for me it's like <laughs> it defeats the purpose of money I'm sorry did you say you think it will be or it won't yes be? it will be you think it, will it definitely be? will be yes well I mean okay. it, it, it's definitely I'm uh, I can bet everything I have and and then more on it okay so some okay because i mean simply already. asking mrs lagarde uh, what there's going to be uh, programmable money uh her response was uh, well we're trying very hard to make it a very green uh, euro okay. anyone want to come back on that so i mean you know <laughs> i'm seeing another hand here i think we can get the roaming mic over there down here Yeah, in my analysis, it's um, it's just a, a way to well, a panicked kind of half baked way of looking at blockchain development, stable coins emerging, maybe even private money, and thinking, oh my God, we need to have a legitimate reason to crush all these competing kind of initiatives that we have no control over, especially if they're decentralized, and so we're going to push out this solution which actually doesn't really do anything new because we can all repay with cards, we already have digital versions of money. Uh, but it'll give us a legitimate reason to say, look, ha, look at what they're doing, money laundering and all these kind of terrible things. And look, we have this new shiny thing, which is a digital version of cash, which is much better, it's cheaper, whatever. So it gives us a legitimate reason to crush all the competition, which have, we have no control over and keep money centralized and in the control of, you know. Yep, he's in the front. Um, maybe it can be a solution for those people who have no bank account and at least they get access to some bank account, even if the amount is limited. Anybody else? Any final thoughts? What you do or do not know about the digital euro? Uh, I had an opinion. I think the digital euro would be a huge opportunity to really redesign money as we know it. Um, and I know there's a lot of fear about programmable money and, and, every, and everything, but if, if, we, if we lose ourselves in fear and, and lose sight of the opportunities that, that this gives us, um, yeah, that would be a real shame. Okay, so some great and diverse, I would say, thoughts already. Uh, let's throw it over to our panel now. And first for the opening remarks, we will hear from Martin. Um, yes, thank you. So I will explain a little bit about reimagining our money system the role of the digital euro. And of course, it fits quite well to the waterworks of money. So I take a bigger uh, scope, so I take a systemic view. And then indeed, so there are options in also, in my view, to go to another monetary system. So I just already said, so we also developed three future scenarios. So with a different design of the waterworks, with a diff different design of the, 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 the money system. and in uh, two of those scenarios, public digital money plays a pivotal role. So CBDC, digital euro, but so something like that is really pivotal if you want to go to a different monetary system. So I will not go into details into those three scenarios, but moves like a bit of theory. So how can we can we understand 
uh, different forms of mo uh, money. So indeed, we have public forms of money and private forms of money. So we have material banknotes and coins today in the Eurozone and most other kinds. So that's public money, physical money. And we have the digital euro that is not existent yet and also proposed for other central bank digital currencies. But of course, we have also a lot of private forms of money. And the, the most people use bank deposits. So the, the, the money in your bank account, that's the most regular form of money in the economy. So that is what most m people use. Uh, especially in the US, you have a lot of money market instruments, but also rich people use them. So there are so-called near monies in the shadow banking system. And of course, also a form of money, all, all those cryptocurrencies like blockchain and Ethereum. And when I have discussions with central bankers about the digital euro, I always make this remark. So I started after my study in 2004 working at ING, and there we're digitalizing all banking process and, and digitalizing bank money. And now two decades, decades later, the central banks are, m m are thinking about the same, so we want to update our physical f form of money. So w they could have started 20 years before, then the discussion would have been much more easy in my, my view, but now more or less the whole system is privatized and now we want to get public money back into the debate. So, but this is, an, I, I don't know, what, what is the exact leader? I never got a really good answer, but I think that is really important to realize. So also other forms of money were in the past were physical. So it's not that bank deposits have been digital for a very long time. So, and also in my PhD thesis that I defended last year, so when you look at the current money system, I think there are at least three big problems. So the first is the system is by design fragile. So bank money, bank deposits, it cannot exist without public safety nets. You need public saf safety nets to keep this um, form of money functioning on a, on a large scale. The second is, so when you look at the banking system, so you have a lot of protections for banking, so deposit, deposit insurance schemes, access to the central bank, renumeration central bank reserves. Uh, I came to 14 the last time I counted them. So you have a lot of protections for banks and on the other hand, like it was explained in the animation, there's a lot of regulations for banks. So we know that those, uh, th that those protection me mechanisms lead to moral hazards or all kinds of hazards. So banks are willing to take more risk and to reduce this risk taking, we, we have a lot of regulations for them. So and you can really question, so do we need this kind of system in market economies? And indeed, so this is also where the watermark is about. So there are a lot of mechanisms in the system contributing or hindering sustainable development or contributing to more inequality or to pollution or to bad behavior. So those three problems are re related to the money system. And so this is my PhD thesis, but it was summarized there recently in March, very well by Martin Wolf. Martin Wolf wrote in the Financial Times, banks are designed to fail and they do. This is a system that is essential to the functi functioning of the market economy, but doesn't operate by its rules. So, and this is also the argument th that I make in my PhD thesis. So when we have a market econ economy, you also want to have at, have at the core a system that is operating in accordance with its rules. And in the current banking system, you can really qu question to what extent that's the case. And so what happened very briefly, so in my view, so this, those bank de deposits were updated to the digital age and public money remained physical. So when the online world came, you of course you had to make bank money, you had to use bank money for all kinds of online payments. And so you couldn't use public money anymore. And when we are more dependent on fragile bank deposits, fragile banks, of course, then you also have to implement more public safety nets and more regulations for the, those banks. So this is also what you see what happens. So deposit insurance schemes is increasing all the times. Uh, more things are accepted as collateral by the central bank. Now, all those kind of things are bigger safe nets, and on the other hand, you see more and more rules for, for banks. And of course, the intention is really good, so they want to avoid a systemic financial crisis. But as Martin Wolf wrote, banks are designed to fail, and they do so, it's happening again and again, no matter what kind of protection mechanisms or regulations you implement. And so there are a lot of consequences. So when you look in the Netherlands, so there's a really highly concentrated uh, market structure. So three big banks, they have 85% of the market. So it's very difficult to enter the market. There are e increasing cost of regulation at the side of the regulator and at the side of the banks. So it's really questionable if this is a good way to organize the system. But we can debate that, of course, in the panel discussions. And so the project about the waterworks, so quite often we have discussions at the Ministry of Finance or other financial institutions in the Netherlands. So we present those mechanisms that are visualized in a map that are hindering or are uh, contributing to, uh, to uh, growing inequality or hindering sustainable development. 
And for instance, I, I only will explain one, unequal access to liquidity. So when you're on the bottom of the pyramid and you go to a bank, yeah, they say you're not credit worthy, so you get you cannot get a loan. And when you are in uh, are when you are at the top and you are a big company or a rich person, then you get a very cheap loan. So this is not helping if you want to tackle inequality. And there are more mechanisms that are we can discuss them, but so but this project is really about identifying those mechanisms and also trying how can we solve them. And so when this digital euro discussion, there are really a lot of big uh, unanswered questions. So can we have a monetary and financial system that operates by the rules of a market economy? How can we do that? And can we use digital technology to realize that, this? And in my view, so why not implement a safe public digital backbone, a digital euro? So the main advantage of a digital euro is you cannot have a bank run on physical cash, so you can also not have a bank run on the digital euro. So it's stable by design, and this is really key. Uh, so you don't need those protection mechanisms and these regulations. And when you have that, you can um, consider liberalizing banks. So in a way, the current proposal of the ECB, it is indeed a small step, um, but also central banks are increasingly em emphasizing that you need to think bigger. Uh, but the difficulty, in my view, with those central bankers, always when you, have th when you have discussions with them, they answer them within their mandate. So the, for them, it's very difficult to have those bigger uh, discussions about do we need different or, or monetary instruments? The, w w why don't we liberalize banking? So that's just not within their mandate. And that therefore, it's very important that politicians take the lead. So I'm very glad there is a politicians. That politicians take really I the lead in developing this monetary system in a digital age. So, and maybe one more concept. So in my PhD thesis, I distingui distinguish between different forms of liquidity. So you have public and private forms, but it's different forms of liquidity are, in my view, even better to understand the current system. So you have things that are inherent liquidity, that are money, th that are money themselves. So again, those banknotes and coins, those digital euro, they are money because we agreed it's money. And the advantage, so it's inherent, so you cannot have a run on, on it, it's the money itself. And then more and more we became dependent on contractual money. So contractual liquidity, and it is a claim on an issuer. So bank deposits are based on this uh, on this construct, but also so-called stable coins. Sometimes they feel like banks, and also several money market instruments. That was mainly the cause of the crisis of 2008. So this construct of contractual liquidity is always a risk. So it can always fail. So and it's really the question is to what extent do we need it in a digital age? Uh, because this one we can introduce the digital euro and also market liquidity. So we have shares and bonds and bitcoins and all those things and they are traded on markets. So that's a different mechanism. Contractual liquidity is a claim on the issuer and market liquidity is when you trade a financial uh, asset on a market. Um, and I would say, this is also my recommendation, my final slide, so what do we need? So in my view, so if you think about sustainable development, so a stable monetary si system is really precondition if you want to reach it. So if there is all the time a crisis or it's very unstable, fragile, then it's really questionable if you can reach sustainable development. A second, so in the long run, I would say that indeed the digital euro, maybe it is now implemented and proposed as a small step, but it could be become the public backbone of the system that is stable by design. And it could also be used as a monetary instrument. So there is a huge field that is not discussed yet, so the ECB is not researching it at all, if you can use the digital euro as a monetary instrument. But of course, some independent economists are doing that, but I think coming years it will become also a, a topic at the ECB. Can we use it in a, uh, as a monetary instrument and how, how should we use it? And then more so for the European Union as a whole. So I think what a strategy sh should, should be in the digital age, you should be far less dependent on contractual liquidity so you need to decrease the importance of bank money and you want to increase market liquidity. So that's just a capital union. So you want to have more tradable securities that are just accessible for everyone. And indeed, so we need inherent public money. So we need this digital euro to a quite a large extent. So if you think about uh, uh, these three forms of liquidity, then you have, a, um, in my view, a much more nuanced discussion. Um, and also then you see better what the opportunities of the digital euro are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And I believe next we'll be hearing from Anna. Uh, I don't know if she, does she have slides? No, okay, perfect. Wait, then I'll hand it over directly to you, Anna, to talk us through the broad strokes of the ECB's proposal. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, uh, Katrin. And no, no time to prepare slides because I knew five minutes before I come, was coming here that I'm actually speaking. I would actually, uh, is the microphone working? I don't have to, okay. I would actually like to come back to the to the to the positions or the, to the to the opinions uh, expressed uh, just just before uh, Martin's presentation because I thought that's very interesting um, questions which you brought up here um, and which we as a consumer organization are hearing every day. So first question or first belief expressed was: Will the digital euro replace cash? And uh, I think this is really the, the, the most important fundamental basis that no, the, the, the answer is no. The European Central Bank doesn't want to replace cash by the digital euro. The digital euro should come on top. Whenever you want to use cash um, to, to in shops, when you want to um, split the bill in a restaurant with your friends, there is no, no problem in using cash in the future. And by the way, the European Commission um, will propose at the end of the month also a proposal where they will introduce the mandatory acceptance, the obligation to accept cash in the future and also the obligation um, that uh, banks give access uh, to cash in the future. So that's, that's a very important prerequisite. Um, then there was um, a wide uh, range between um, from you uh, between the digital euro will not bring any added value and perhaps the digital euro will bring us some added value. I mean, you mentioned perhaps for people who don't have a bank account, uh, will it bring access to a digital payment method? Um, and I think that's that's the second thing that um, the the real objective from um, from the European Central Bank of the um, digital euro is um, to have a public payment method which works in a digital world. Meaning that when you go online, when you shop online, when you um, want to make a payment to your government, for example, for a tax, you have a public payment method which is ruled by public rules um, with which you can pay. And that we currently don't have in a digital world. Whenever you use cash, it's a public payment method. Whenever you go online, when you make a credit transfer, when you, um, when you use your credit card or your debit card, it's a private money. So that's uh, something which is currently missing. And uh, what does that mean is also that when you have only private payment methods and going in a more digitalized world where, where we pay more and more online, um, is that uh, we don't any have, have any more a, a, a payment method which has, which is really ruled by by the public, where um, we decide how much it will cost for consumers, how much privacy you will get, how do we make sure that people who currently don't have a bank account are actually able to intervene in a, in a, in a digital world and be able to pay online? Because I mean, um, what we are often facing as a consumer organization is that there is little interest to onboard people who are currently financially excluded. What we hear from, I mean, from the commercial banks is it's very expensive to keep bank branches open and ATMs. It's um, not, I mean, it's not from a financial point of view attractive to have um, elderly consumers coming in, taking a long time uh, over the counter, retrieving some money. I mean, that's not something which from a commercial bank perspective is very attractive. So what we need there is rules from a public institution obliging uh, commercial banks who will be, that, by the way, those who distribute the digital euro to, to offer these services. And um, that's, uh, from our perspective, the main added value of a, of a digital euro as compared to, to private payment methods that we really, as, as citizens, as consumers, we have the hands on um, via, I mean, um, representatives in the European Parliament we are, um, we are national central banks, we are the European Central Bank, which have a public mandate and defend the general interests of the European Union to really uh, say what we want. And uh, that with a private payment method, if you go, I mean, just saying like Visa, MasterCard whatsoever, there is no consumer representative when defining the, the, the panel, there is no one, uh, defending the general interest of European citizens. So that's really the, the difference. 
And um, of course, there has been a lot of preparatory process already with the European Central Bank. They have brainstormed a lot, uh, to put it in simple words, um, how, how should privacy look like? Um, and there is the idea that there should be um, privacy and higher levels of privacy than for digital payment methods. Um, there is the idea that um, we should give consumers free access to, to the digital euro, um, so yet everyone could have a, a digital euro account free of charge, and all the basic services which you need to pay, make the daily payments are offered free of charge. Um, but of course the process is just starting now at a political level, and the uh, European Parliament and um, the Member States will discuss together based on a Commission proposal which is coming out uh, end of June. Um, to really set these um, these rules, which will um, make the digital euro hopefully a, a project which is really in the interest of consumers and not as in my, what you explained in all the maps in the interest of the of the commercial banks. And then perhaps uh, one last word on the because that's also something coming up a lot is this: Will it be programmable money? Will it be money which works like a voucher, which only which you can use only? For a specific purchase, I mean, think in Belgium of the of the meal vouchers, which, which you have uh, often in your wallet, which you can only use in 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 dedic for a dedicated purpose to buy your lunch, for example. That's something which the ECB already clearly ruled out. Um, the digital euro should be exchangeable um, fully with banknotes and coins. So um, there is not a limit that you could for the best or for the worst, huh? um, use the digital euro only to, to renovate your house or um, to buy your lunch or these kind of things. So it should be really working like cash, but complementary to cash and not, um, not, uh, not uh, replacing it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and now I'll hand it over to Henrika. Yes, thank you very much, um, and thanks uh, for the wonderful invitation uh, to talk about these important topics. And I think, um, you know, of course, we share a lot of views here on this stage. So I wonder if you would invite some other stakeholders. They have a very different approach, of course. First of all, commercial banks, of course, but also some governments in Europe. So that would be interesting. But of course, I mean, we look all in the same direction as the Greens, if we do that as well. And I think there's so many potential on this project of the digital euro we can use. And I mean, with regard to the European elections we have next year, for example, will be the first election we have that young people vote uh, at the age of say 16 in Germany, for example, and I mean, uh, this is a, such a wonderful, important project, the digital Europe, because we all know, of course, that uh, people uh, pay less and less with cash, but also younger people do that, and it's a young, fresh project uh, Project we have in mind. We can implement uh, so many uh, um, justice aspects we, we really need in our economic and financial system. So I think it's a really fresh and wonderful pro project, and I'm really looking forward to the uh, draft of the commission. I think it's a uh, well, of course, I mean, um, we have a lot of um, input already on the ECB. We have seen in the Economic and Monetary Committee, I, I'm a member of or substituted member of, and um, they progress uh, already in a way that you say, well, hey, let's let's get into that process already, also from the parliamentarian perspective, because it's so important what we see. And of course, we know uh, it's an op opportunity to re-establish uh, money as a truly public good. Uh, so I think we... We share that concern and um, also the chance we, we can see here. And um, we, we see as well, of course, I mean, it, it has to be universally acceptable. It was mentioned before uh, in the first row already that uh, you picked it up. Uh, th more than 30 million people in the European Union don't have a bank account. Uh, so I think it would be a good project in this regard as well to have more justice on that. And I mean, um, instead uh, that we wish we should have a public option for the use of digital euros uh, for example, in Germany, you have post offices, for example, taking care of banking stuff. You know, you have uh, long lines sometimes. You have to wait for that, but it's uh, uh, an approach we can we can use in that regard, for example. And uh, we have some other aspects that are important, for example, free of charge. It has to be, of course. I mean, and we have as parliamentarians now the chance to define what kind, what especially has to be free of charge. I mean, it's also something uh, like a list of basic services you know, to have a, an account to make basic pay payments and these kind of things. And of 
course, we also have to define who carries the cost of the digital euro, who has to pay for it. And I think the best solution for that would be to charge merchant fees as long as what merchants have to pay is fair. Of course, I mean, we have to make compromises there and not to, to exaggerate it, but I think uh, a fair compromise would be good. And if, if you look at it, you were mentioning before, Visa and MasterCard handle 70% of um, all card payments in the European Union as the mo at the moment, while either Worldline or Nexi provide most payment terminals, right? And so we can uh, equalize that approach a little with that new project. And I think this is what the European Union is all about, right? We have a system and we have to recreate it and make it better, right? And of course, we can't do that at once in an overall approach, but we have to focus on different projects. And the digital euro is one of, one of those projects we can make the financial system better in general, right? And then this is a good chance, I think. And then, of course, um, the, um, the question of privacy. I, when, when we look at cash, for example, we can, we can do some private stuff, some, you know, giving money to someone, uh, to an actor that uh, has to be, uh, of course, safe as well in a, in a matter, you know, when you have low uh, payments that has, has to be uh, possible without tracing all uh, what you're doing, but of course, if, if it's a certain amount which is higher, then we have to, as a political actors, of course, we have to take care of money laundering and um, the potential uh, financing of terrorist activities, these kind of things. So we have to find a balance here as well. And then uh, the digital euro, of course, had to, has to be um, resilient. And um, I think this is the core proposition we also have, uh, the second one from the Greens perspective, the core academic of the digital euro payment system should be owned and operated by the euro system. And this is the new approach we have here because this would ensure the needed accountability to make payment systems more resilient. And this is the new approach and a very European approach. And once again, I mean, I remind to the coherence aspect. We need uh, equality also in all the member states, right? For someone who is um, living in Romania at the countryside, has no access, you know, uh, a farmer to, to these kind of uh, services how can we uh, join, let him join and participate on that uh, monetary system we have, financial system, in an equal way, as well as in one of the more richer, richer member states where we have a little more chances to be involved in these kind of things and have more participation. So, yeah, I think uh, we have seen that the ECB has done some work already, uh, and we will look carefully. I think there's a draft already uh, we can have or check a little on the first draft. Um, and then uh, I think right uh, the uh, timeline will be in September. We will really start to focus uh, from the parliamentary perspective. And I think um, it will be necessary to listen to all stakeholders. But of course, I, as you can imagine, uh, I'm a member of the Greens. We have, of course, our traditions who we will listen to and some, some we, and who, will sh who sh we, we share the perspective with. But of course, we have to listen very carefully also to um, the other opinions because I have the feeling there's no uh, such a conviction already that we need the digital euro. Uh, there's sim still something. It has to be a public project, but we need the support of the public for that it means like every single NGO, every stakeholder here is very important this evening as well. If we want that project, that we fight for that, that we get a public for that, and uh, you know make a move in that direction. Because if only one, some parliamentarians like it, or the Commission itself, but we have uh, some commercial banks with lots of power behind against it because they ask, of course. Um, what does it mean for me? I mean, if you have uh, money on the bank account, I. I understood it's liquidity for the banks, it's a loan, right? And But if you have a digital euro project now, it's a demand to the ECB. That's completely different. And we have to, to take care, of, of course, of all the arguments and all what it means and who will pay for it, who, who uh, has the best benefit of it and why. And will, it won't be enough just the public. We need additional arguments for that to be stronger, right, and to convince all the stakeholders. And I'm looking forward to that process. And if we work on that together, I'm very lucky. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, and before I open the floor to audience questions, I just want to give any of the panelists a chance to uh, respond to anything that came up in those opening remarks, if there's anything you guys want to weigh in on. If not, we'll go directly to the audience. Okay. 
Audience questions. The floor is open. I'm seeing lots of hands already. That's amazing. Uh, yes, sorry, you were first. <laughs> we have a roaming mic. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, two questions, if I may. Um, one for Mark Tang. In your in your system that you proposed, uh, I, I've heard some people talk about this uh, alternative system where you kind of bypass commercial banks, essentially. Uh, in this system, who would lend to the economy? Which is the main kind of counter counter challenge I've heard to that that system. Um, and my second question is uh, a more general one. I've heard a lot of skepticism from MEPs and even I would say from member states reading between the lines about whether you need to do a digital euro at all. Um, we've heard one very specific thing that the digital euro could be empowered to do uh, in terms of changing the money system, but it's not quite clear that that's what the ECB wants it to do. Um, so why is it having such a hard time, this project, getting political buy-in? And do should there come a moment when MEPs or, or governments should say, actually, we don't want this to go ahead at all, or you know, we can't see the reasons why we should do this. Um, can, you, can, can you just see that happening? And sorry, I should have said this when I started. Please introduce yourself when you ask a question and let yeah. us know who the question is for. Sorry, Jack Sinclair for Coinbase. So I will answer your first question. This one has to do with me. I I, no, 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 I don't think so. No, so so what I try to say, so what I think what is needed in Europe that we grow the non-bank funding channel. So like when you go when you look at the US, we have um, much more non-banks that finance the real economy, and the big advantage when it, when it are non-banks, they can also take more risks. And we, if you think about the transition towards a circular economy or all kind of digital in, in, investments that are probably needed, then you need to take more risks. So it's not that you completely have to abolish banking, but you should, in my view, so grow the digital euro, grow the non-bank funding channel, and then banking is less important in Europe. That's what is needed, in my view. You guys. Yes, uh, I mean, there is a lot of political bias. And I mean, you have here different interests represented. So you have the commercial banks who very openly speaking, hate this project because um, it creates a competition with their private payment markets. So it's of course, I mean, and, and this narrative is already floating a lot in the in the in the public sphere that it will not bring added value. Um, why should we do this project now? And at the other hand, perhaps also like having too many ex expectations in the project that we will change the whole financial system with this digital euro which i think is probably then also perhaps a bit too ambitious to really to really manage to to do it but it can be for for, for my perspective really a start in the sense that we have a public payment method um, we have something which brings us additional privacy we have something which brings us additional uh, financial inclusion and um, if we get this right then we should go ahead I think, uh, of course, um, um, you know, the mic, uh, the introduction of market components is a good thing for consumers, of course, right? Because it will affect uh, what it costs and, you know, competition is something good. But this, again, will not be a convincing argument to some stakeholders, but from for us as politicians, of course, it is very relevant. More questions? Yes, uh, the man in the blue. Hello, uh, Jos Mulder, Better Europe Public Affairs. Um, question mostly to Martijn, I think. You uh, eloquently explained why it is important to um, have different forms of uh, liquidity. Now, from what I understand from the latest um, rumors about the Commission proposal is that despite the good examples that Ms. Hahn mentioned about post offices distributing digital euro apps, um, is that the dominant form of distribution will be with commercial banks. How um, can we you change the proposal to make sure that it actually does steer us away from um, commercial bank-based forms of liquidity. Um, yeah, so <laughs> then commercial banks offer public liquidity, but I think definitely we should emphasize again and again that we also need public options. So that's really the key element. And the second thing related to that is the limit. That's of course one of the most questionable <laughs> parts of the proposal. 
So why would you propose something with a limit? And that's to protect the current banking system. And that's also, in my view, the narrative. So th this is also why people start to distrust us. So most people after 2008 know that the banking system is fragile. And if you say that we have a safe alternative, so in the Dutch debate it was always about we need a sa safe alternative outside the banking system. And then, then there will be a safe alternative, but then you, you cannot access it really. So there's 3,000 euros, that's the limit. So this is really so why a lot of people, in my view, also start to distrust the public option. And then the question is, so why do we need that limit or can we gradually increase the limit or is there a kind of, or how, how is that going to, uh, to, to happen in the uh, coming decade? So that kind of discussions will definitely come when it is there, but I think we can better have them now. I think you're raising two really important themes here, which are at the top of a lot of people's minds, which is the distribution, how we're going to physically have access to the digital euro in future, and whether or not there's going to be a limit on how many you can hold. Those things will obviously change the shape a lot of how it looks in our daily lives. Any, uh, any insights here to add? You guys want to come back on this, these two issues? Yeah, perhaps first on the, on the public versus private distribution. Um, this is an idea, I mean, the first idea from the European Central Bank was to only have private distribution by commercial banks. And then um, following the pressure of a lot of NGOs, etc., I, I, at least that's my feeling, and also from the, from the European Parliament, is that um, there has been added um, in May the idea of a public um, distribution model on top, um, where each member state would um, designate one public entity, could be a local authority, could be a publicly licensed entity, so you, you have a private entity, but there is a lot of obligations attached to it, um, which would distribute uh, the digital euro specifically for financially, um, I mean, for, for vulnerable consumers, which um, we can directly say, um, I mean, from a consumer perspective, everyone should get access via the public, uh, public intermediary, and it shouldn't only be eligible consumer groups, which also makes it hard for those who are eligible because you have a lot of administrative burden to prove that you have the, you are the happy one to, to get access via the public um, stream. But this is a move in the direction of um, having a stronger um, public ownership of the project. And uh, this is something which we can well discuss in the, in the legislative proposal. What is the place for this public intermediary? And then perhaps quickly on the, on the holding limits. Um, Yes, there is this idea of having a holding limit. Uh, I think the ECB has a 3,000 euro in mind. Um, this can be, of course, an important limit for consumers because we want a, a, an account which is fully functional, which you can use for your daily payments. You don't need to top up every, now, every day to basically do what you need to do. Um, but, of course, we can also discuss this, this level and... Um, if it's a very high level, there is a lot of leeway left to consumers to, to navigate within this level. So I wouldn't say it's it's completely destructing the, the project if we if we set a reasonable level. Yeah, let me add that. I mean, uh, on on the uh, the aspect of the limiting de deposits, um, uh, well, there is no conclusive study at the moment so on the effects of the introduction of the digital euro um, on the stability of the banking sector. Nevertheless, we have. Um, uh, an estimation of the European Parliament uh, research service that um, concluded that the ECB's current plans of limiting deposits to 3,000 uh, euro is not fully justified by the existing literature, so it means like there's still some research to do. And I think, in my opinion, putting a holding limit in place as a transitioning measure is a good idea, better than being sorry afterwards. And I've, I've seen, of course, I mean, there is lots of resistance when you talk about the figure of 3,000, because then you have the argument, for example, some well, too many banks are concerned by that, right, in a negative way. So, I, but I think from the parliamentarian perspective, it shouldn't, uh, um, it shouldn't. Uh, be prevented that discussion just from from the you know the specific figures doesn't mean too much right but the, it's the principle that counts and we have to discuss here. So the limit is really uh, crucial and indeed so in a transition you can understand it. And I also dis discuss quite often with bankers, so deposit insurance, and we all know that's a kind of subsidy for the bank. So is that the public protection mechanism for the banks? 
And when you have a safe alternative, you really don't need th those things that much anymore. They can decrease indeed the, the, the insured amount. So those kind of transition transition paths that should be really developed in my view. So increasing the amount of digital years, decreasing deposit insurance schemes. So those kind of things, you open the way to, to have that kind of proposals. Uh, and I think so there's indeed a lot of research to be done. And so the, 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 that's why I'm sometimes a I'm a little bit disappointed when I read those ECB reports because the scope is that narrow. And there is of course this work is about, so everything is connected to everything. And when you when you make the scope to narrow, then you never go, go make the big steps or come to the, the next level as a system. And if you really want to have public digital liquidity as the core of the system, that can be in the long term, I think a really good, so also a really good asset of the European economy, then you should have yeah, research on that, debates about that, but that's not really happening yet. Perfect, more questions? Oh, okay, I'm seeing a lot of hands uh, at the back there. Hello, my name is uh, Jimena Gonzalez. I work in a public affairs consultancy firm, CREAP, here in Brussels. I have a question on timing because uh, when we started this event today at 6, um, Politico reported that the proposal by the Commission will be delayed again. So um, taking into account that the European elections are around the corner, I have a question for Mrs. Han on whether you know, the Parliament is uh, planning to take the digital euro as a priority and what are the Parliament's plans on this? considering that the proposal might be, of course, um, further delayed? This is a very good question. I would like to find out as well. And as I wondered at the beginning when I uh, was um, wondering about the German government's perspective, uh, for example, right, I can imagine that it's not on the top priority list of the governments, but this is something we still we still have to find out. I mean, we know that at the moment, as we can see uh, on the Critical Raw Materials Act, that it's possible, obviously, if uh, governments are very interested in something, that we can accelerate the process. I mean, we parliamentarians also, you know, currently work on this Critical Raw Materials Act in a way that is much quicker than, than you can ever imagine in general, right? Uh, uh, but I can imagine, so from my personal view, I think it's not the very top, top priority. Uh, at the moment, uh, we fight uh, on parliamentary level on so many issues at the moment uh, with regard to the European elections, right? The Green Deal is attacked in such a heavy way at the, at the moment with regard to the European elections. And I think this won't get any easier in the country in the following months. So, uh, but I personally, I think it's a good project and let's see what uh, the proposal shows, um, you know, and how we can form the majority for that. It depends, of course. I mean, but my, my first guess would be it's not the very top, top priority. Let's see, even if it's mine. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to piggyback on that question to ask a little bit about the, the upcoming negotiation process when the Commission's proposal does come out, whenever that may be. You guys will be leading on uh, co-legislators negotiating. What are the key issues that will be at the top of your mind when you're going through those negotiations? I mean, some some of the, the aspects um, I mentioned already, that it's a public good, of course, with all the correlating um, positions that we have here. And um, we have to uh, to form of course, the basic provisions. We need how, how it's how we can how we can pay for that, of course, will be very important. And, um, you know, how it fits in the system at the moment that we can reconciliate um, um, this approach we have on the parliament's perspective um, as well with with uh, the banking sector in a way that we we work together that we, that it's not perceived in a way um, that is uh, um, replacing the c current monetary system because this is not what we want of course but that, that is something additional that really serves uh, the needs to the people and it is part of a European integration project as well so this is something uh, I think this will be the subtext of all what we claim for. And do you think this is a proposal that's going to be popular with lawmakers? Well, you know, uh, we didn't start already the discussions yet because it's so fresh. Um, I can I can at least uh, say that I try to to push it in Germany uh, because I think it's a cool, young, fresh project uh, and in so many ways. And um, we will see after the summer, I think we will see some first reactions in a way that we can presume a little uh, what will take place. Perfect. More questions? Yes, in the front, colorful shirt. Yeah, I, I 
found the the uh, the drawings re really interesting and with a lot of imagination. And also, I mean, I was uh, I was expecting more from from uh, from what we saw in the animation. But you know, if we want to get people excited about this uh, project, there has to be some so, some meat on the bone. And and if if we in in this uh, you know in a conference of people that are basically interested in this project, we 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 don't make it exciting, you know. Like, how do the euros get to the to that digital euro? I mean, how we, we, are we going to change how the money is created? Could it be a chance to uh, uh, work on cohesion? Uh, how do we get the excluded into the financial system? Uh, could it be a way to uh, to uh, launch a form of basic income? Could it be for universal services? I mean that that kind of things I think would would uh, would would create an interest in the in the project. I was uh, I was surprised by you know like uh, the, the fact that money could be programmable. For example, could it be a way to uh, to uh, promote the Green Deal? Could we sponsor uh, sustainable patterns, things like that? Uh, can can we change the the way the water flows? Uh, if if we don't dare to be, uh, you know, uh, imaginative, uh, I think uh, yeah, it won't fly. It's sort of a Mickey Mouse project. Maybe they're, they're launching it in China. We should have one, whatever. We don't know. We've central bankers. We have no imagination. I mean, we run the things like they've already been run. Money goes to the ones that already have money. And, uh, you know. Uh... Thanks. That's, uh, thanks for the excellent remark, because um, I definitely share these kind of thoughts. And uh, we really have to think about these kind of things, like how the digital Europe can fly. And I think, listening to you as well, um, it's, a, it's a project of social justice. And so it is part of the Green Deal. And as we have seen with the, um, with the war in Europe, I mean, justice, social justice is getting more and more important because we have so many uh, challenges at the moment from inflation to um, energy security and poverty is so central to people at the moment. Uh, so I think so it, it's it's part of the social justice movement movement and in a way that we really have to make better our our system and the Europe, what the European Union how they can how how we can serve the people uh, in in the European uh, uh, Union and I think uh, it it should be sub subsumed in and in, in going in that direction because I think there are so many uh, parts of it like we, we talked about it like uh, both that we need pu public and private intermediaries, for example, that we, um, you know, need fair merchant fees. And then we, of course, um, have to combine that, you know, with the arguments. But it's think I think we go in the right, di right direction with the social justice claim. And uh, that's at least what I think in this moment, uh, because it's really needed and very central. And this will be a central aspect also in the European elections, of course, because people, uh, also the parties, have recognized that it's very important, much more than climate and environment, for example, for, for lots of people, that we have to bind these aspects together, so of course. Yeah, so I think you're, you're raising an interesting issue here, and it's something that we've touched on through the panel about the potential of the future digital euro for consumer protection, for financial inclusion versus potentially the reality. Uh, and I just want to throw it out to you guys. Do you think that the current plans for the digital euro match up to its potential for consumer protection? Would you want to see something different? Yeah, I mean, that's that's always the, um, the starting point of many, many um, presentations from, 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 the, from the public institutions is that the digital euro should not be too attractive because there is this, this, this general fear that uh, people will run uh, in changing uh, their payment behavior. I think if I ask you about um, how do you pay, probably everyone has very definite uh, opinion about uh, how he usually pays and will not change this payment behavior from one day to the next because it's always a bit of a uh, challenge to like uh, set up a new app or remember a new pin code or these kind of things. So it's not something which uh, people change every day. Um, how they pay because it's something which we want that it works, but we don't want to spend too much time about uh, thinking about how it works. So if we want a digital euro, we really not need something very attractive. And um, 
that's something which uh, we would definitely like to bring in. I mean, we, we, we saw now a, a leaked proposal and um, to have, for example, a digital euro, which you can use in, in full privacy, you can pay offline in full privacy. We would like to see that also online at until a, a, a certain limit that you that you can uh, um, have more privacy, that not every transaction you are doing is tracked and traced. Um, so this is something we would like to have it also that everyone can use it. And that's for digital payment method not a given. When we look at, at studies, for example, the, the Dutch uh, central bank had a study showing that between 15 to 20 percent of the people um, have problems in using uh, digital payment methods. So how do you work with 15 percent of your population in a more and more digital world to not be able to use something as basic as payments? Um, and there the digital euro can really come in as a, as you, as you name it, as a social justice project too get more accessible yeah and this i think this um, at attractive but not too successful that is telling everything about the project so in a way i think you can develop the best form of money ever in history so that could, could also be the story there's high privacy there's uh, is about justice but it is not not a story that is being told and this is also what why i think a lot of people start to distrust it so I think I so I also cannot imagine I worked at ING so also in the time of internet banking of course people then wanted to develop the best apps the best website the most beautiful things and that's an, quite a different mentality and it is so apparently it's very difficult to get this in innovation out of the public domain with a real f yeah, with a bigger story so I don't know what is there the the the, the, the real problem um, you've been waiting a long time sorry the, the man in the red shirt <laughs> you have a question Eduard Jung, I have been techni uh, technically involved in uh, electronic money for a long time. So my, my question is about electronic money, especially the offline version of it, which has the technical capability to be complete equivalent to cash. So where everybody carries its cash with him and where the payment is completely anonymous, the payer, and uh, you don't have limits and there are no costs involved. So if you talk about reducing the cost of the payment to society, the form of e-cash is the best way forward. And doesn't exclude using bank accounts in addition to having an e-money system, but an e-money system has to be completely self-sustainable and not, as the proposals are, an on annex where you can ask for uh, the feature of being able to pay offline for some money when you can't pay online, which is an unusable system because nobody is going to carry around money in order to not to be able to pay when it when you can't you have to make a different system so how, how can we get there <laughs> yeah I, I don't know exactly so with this offline version is really interesting uh, but there are a lot of techno technological challenges still so we don't know exactly if it were if it can function on large scale and if there is not a bug and when there is a bug then there is a real big prob problem and indeed then i think that the politician sh should debate do we want that so is that what 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 is what we desire in the long run? And I don't have that answer. M maybe you have the answer. No additional aspect I can add here. We are pushing up against the end of our time slot. So any yeah, very final quick question. Uh, my name is Steph Kappers. I work for Haponomy. We are a research center uh, to transition to a regenerative economy. And uh, part of the research that we do is around monetary systems and how design of monetary systems link to uh, sustainable and regenerative behavior. So my question is actually, how can we help? Because we've, uh, we've been doing research on, on this topic for several years now, and we would love to uh, share our knowledge and expertise um, to contribute to what could be a great digital euro. So maybe you guys can connect at the cocktail afterwards. Um, but otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> does, does anyone want to touch on sustainability aspects of, of the digital euro? Maybe Anna, do you have anything here? I mean, first of all, what what is perhaps the, the, the real basic of, of the dig, um, sustainability in the digital euro is to have a technology which is sustainable, um, meaning that um, we use uh, a technology which is not too energy consuming, 
And uh, I think that's something which uh, the ECB is also carefully looking into. Um, and then I think uh, the other aspect which y which you can refer to is this whole aspect of programmabil programmability. So and and but other than that, I mean it's it's a payment method. So <laughs> yeah, okay, we are very much out of time. So if there are any final closing thoughts from the panelists, anybody? Okay, I think everybody's eager to get to their glasses of wine. So all I will say is thank you very much for joining us at this Positive Money Europe event on the Digital Euro. And let's hear it for our panelists.